Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 94 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So it's great to be back again this week. I missed you guys during my unplanned hiatus of the show. Hopefully it gave you a chance to catch up on some of the backlist episodes. Uh, if you're a new listener and aren't sure where to start, I've got an organized list if you go to JennyLisk.com, which is my website. And up on the very top of the page, you'll see a choice that says Start Here. And I've organized the episodes there by topic and by audience. So that would be a good place to start. Um, or of course you can always start on episode one and just listen straight through. And some people have told me they do that and find that useful as well. So a couple updates for you before we get into today's topic. I hope you had a chance to listen to last week's discussion with Pamela Addison. And we were talking about young COVID widows and Pamela actually lost her husband very early in the pandemic and has started a Facebook group for younger COVID widows and widowers to support each other um, in that group. So I hope you'll check that out. And as we're approaching 500,000 deaths in the U.S. uh, from COVID, I think this topic is becoming more and more critical that there are, unfortunately, more widowed parents um, every day and every week. So I hope that the ones who are parenting kids and teenagers will find their way to this show and the resources that are available here to them. So do check that out last week's episode. In the coming weeks, I've got some terrific discussions coming up. Um, Episodes with Mira Simone and Karen Paul, and both of them are widowed parents, sharing their journeys and their reflections. And I always think it's so great to talk with other widowed parents who are a bit down this path because it makes um, people feel less alone when when they can hear other people's journeys and think about which maybe which parts of the journeys are similar to theirs or get some tips or ideas from them. So um, look for those in the coming weeks and also my discussion with Dara Kurtz talking all about writing letters, legacy letters and just become just because letters and everything about writing letters um, as it relates to people being sick, people passing away, um, the time after someone passes away. So do tune in for that one as well. And I want to make sure you guys know that I have a book club guide available now for Future Widow. So if your book club is reading Future Widow, you can just go to JennyLisk.com slash book clubs. That's book clubs, all one word and download, I've got for free there, uh, some discussion questions that may help your book club, uh, you know, help uh, spark some discussion there. And I'd be happy to drop into your Zoom book club as well, if you'd like, and, you know, chat about the book and chat about your experiences and whatever you guys want to talk about. So um, reach out to me if that is of interest. And finally, if you've read Future Widow, um, I hope you'll leave a review on Amazon.com. I've put some tips on on my website, uh, jennylisk.com slash review. Um, Not obviously telling you what to write, but giving you some some questions to prompt thinking um, about what you might want to write, like what's something you learned from the book or what sort of reader might like this book, Um, some prompts like that so that, you know, it can be hard to stare at a blank screen and decide what to write. So I put together a few tips and uh, the links to Amazon and other places to leave reviews are on that page too. So jennylisk.com slash review. Okay, let's get on with today's show. Today's episode is brought to you by my very own book. It's called Future Widow, Losing My Husband, Saving My Family, Finding My Voice. And it's a memoir and you can find out all about it at futurewidowbook.com. That's futurewidowbook.com. And there you can find the links to buy it everywhere books are sold. And look for the button that says buy the ebook directly from the author and you can save 15%. Just use the special code listener15, that's listener15, and we go to futurewidowbook.com. I hope you check it out and I hope you love it. I had such a great discussion with Melissa Gould for this episode. Melissa is the author of the brand new memoir, Widowish, in which she shares with us her journey of becoming a young widow and her life in the years since. And I gotta tell you, it was so much fun to talk with Melissa about her book and discover the similarities 
and the differences in our experience. I talked with her um, back when I was putting the finishing touches on my book, so it's been really fun to support each other's writing journeys and have our books both released right around the same time. It's been terrific to see her success, and I hope you guys will check out her book after listening to our discussion. We talk all about her book. We talk about her husband's diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, which actually was a few years before, and that's not what he died of, so she'll tell us more about all of that. Um, Also, her first months and years as a widowed person, a younger widowed person and a widowed parent, and how she, um, well, why she named her book Widowish. Um, so listen for that. And she talked about some of the things she ended up doing to cope, um, things she didn't initially think were going to be helpful, which ended up being quite helpful to her. So please do have a listen, and I hope you enjoy my discussion with Melissa Gould. My guest today is Melissa Gould, author of the new memoir, Widow-ish, which comes out on February 2nd. Melissa is a writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and more. She is also an award-winning screenwriter whose credits include Bill Nye the Science Guy, Party of Five, Beverly Hills 90210, and Lizzie McGuire. Melissa is joining us today from Los Angeles, California. Melissa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Nice to see you, Jenny. Yeah, yeah, I've really been looking forward to talking with you today, and I really enjoyed reading your memoir, and it's, it's always so interesting to, you know, to read other people's stories and, who are widows and widowed parents and, uh, and to be able to share them with my listeners, so I'm really looking forward to, to uh, them hearing our discussion and picking up your book. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, and so along those lines, if you don't mind, I would like to ask if you'd start out by reading a passage from your new memoir, Widowish, and uh, and this is on page one eighty. Okay. There was an expectation about the widow. Was I sad enough? Was it okay to see me smile? Was I allowed to feel happy? I felt like I was failing at widowhood. I missed my husband, but no one knew that when they looked at me. They just saw a mom with blonde highlights, going to yoga, picking up her daughter from school, buying groceries at Trader Joe's. And now I was at a party with a date when I should have been home, grieving, all alone. I didn't look like a widow. I wasn't acting like a widow, but I felt like a widow. I guess I was just widow-ish. Ah, aha. Okay, thank you for, for starting us off with that. So let's, let's okay, so widow-ish. So that's your title. So, t- so what does that mean to you? Why did you pick that as a title? Well, in some ways, uh, I kind of use the word ish all the time. Like somebody, my daughter would say, Mom, is it hot outside? And I'd say, ish. Um, <laughs> I also feel like, and this is um, in the book also, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I always say I'm Jewish. <laughs> and um, because I'm more Jewish in a cultural way than a religious way, and I don't have a full understanding of the religion. Um, and I kind of felt that way about being a widow. I, ah. I couldn't really, it was so strange to me. Um, being a widow because I felt like I was still married mm. and I couldn't really reconcile how that was different. Now, even though my husband had died, I, I kind of was like, I, you know, I just kept feeling like I'm, I am a widow obviously, but it, 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 you know, I didn't look like a widow. It's what I just read. I just, I could tell by the way I was perceived in the world that, people wouldn't know it to look at me. Uh, And I felt like it was so important. It was this disconnect, I felt, because I wanted people to know. I wanted people to know I was married and that my husband died, but I didn't necessarily want to call myself a widow. Mm, mm -hmm. And that might conjure up some other, you're imagining an older woman, some other characteristics that maybe wouldn't, wouldn't be you. Yeah. I mean, definitely older, um, completely bereft, you know, which I, again, I was those things, but I, I mean, I wasn't older, obviously, but 
yeah, just I think when people hear widow, they don't think of somebody in their 40s. Right. And you were, how old were you when your husband died? I had just literally days before turned 46. Okay. 46. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's, okay, let's back up then before we get um, into more discussion of the book and some of these things and just set the stage for us, if you would, like, just turn the clock way back to when life was completely normal. Tell us about yourself and your family and what was normal life like before things started to change. Um, you know, Joel and I met when I was a teenager and we were both working at a record company. It was my summer job and it was his real job. He was four years older than me. Um, and we had a really strong connection and formed a friendship. And because, you know, we were both so young, you know, our lives each went on without each other and we stayed in touch in those days there was no email or text so um we would pick up the phone every couple of months i you know we'd hear i'd hear from him or i'd give him a call um and eventually when we got together it was just a matter of timing like the timing was right we always had this thing for each other i always felt like joel i wanted to marry somebody just like him mm. it, it never occurred to me that it would actually be him but yeah you know, it, it ended up being him. And I think because we were friends, we had a really strong bond as a married couple and we shared everything with each other and our love was so deep and we had such a strong connection. And, you know, Joel stayed in the music business and he um, ultimately had his own company, a music marketing company and I went on to become a TV writer and we were really living a sort of you know, low key LA life. It, it mm. wasn't unusual to, you know, meet other writers all the time. Everybody we knew was either like worked on a show or had just come back from a movie and same thing with Joel and all of his connections. They were, you know, musicians or people who worked at record labels or producers producing records. And um, it was just, we had, we had a really nice life together and Joel was always very healthy and very active. And uh, we had our daughter a few years after we got married and um, we always wanted a bigger family. It wasn't in the cards. So it was just the three of us. And Joel was an incredibly loving and doting husband and father. And he and Sophie had, such a strong connection and they had their daddy daughter days and daddy daughter dates. And um, we were just living a really nice, comfortable life. Mm -hmm. And when Sophie was around eight years old, Joel was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. and it was a devastating diagnosis because it is a lifelong, potentially debilitating disease. And for Joel, who was so active, I mean, he played in softball games once a week, basketball games once a week. He went to the gym every day. He would play racquetball several times a month. He was like a really physical person. He would ride his bike to work. Um, and the reason he, we even realized that he had MS and got that diagnosis was because he came home from one of his basketball games one night and said, something's really wrong. I, it's like I see the ball going down the court and my instinct is to go after it and I can't move my legs. Oh, wow. And so we knew it was going to be something serious. And, um, and then when he got the diagnosis, you know, we're, we live in Los Angeles, we got you know, some of the, one of the worlds at the time, um, he's since retired, but Joel's doctor was one of the more renowned MS doctors. And thankfully we were able to be under his care and Joel got the help he needed. And he was taking medication that was meant to stave off the progression of the disease. And it worked for, for years. I mean, Joel, um, you know, he did have to make lifestyle changes. He, um, took up yoga when he realized he could no longer play basketball. I mean, all of these things were, were like, we were managing and we were continuing to live a life and we were figuring it out. But along the way, 
you know, the things that were making him him were kind of things he could no longer do. Mm. Even going to concerts. I mean, like I said, he was in the music industry and he would go to concerts, you know, several times a week we would go together. Um, and he couldn't go anymore if he didn't have a seat. Uh, because standing for that long was too uncomfortable. Right. Okay. So we made these life modifications and he started, we, you know, we both, we started just living with the MS and it was working. And then I would say um, in 2013. So this is after how many years since diagnosis about? Um, four, four or five, four or five years so, after we were diagnosed. So Sophie's and, around 13 now? Yes. Okay. And I mean, it was then. Yeah, it was a it was a big year. Um, 2013. Joel was turning 50. Sophie was having her bat mitzvah, and there was a lot to look forward to. But truly, the beginning. I mean, starting in January, Joel was just not doing well. Mm. And the MS meds, I learned. We both learned really have a lifespan. So the meds that may work really well for a few years stop working as well and okay. we were on this quest and and it may be different now i don't know if, you know i haven't kept up with ms medications but there are some really great ones out there and joel found the one that worked for him mm. but um after a while it, it just wasn't working as well and we were on this quest to find a new medication but it was very difficult um to find one that gave him the same relief as the one that had stopped working Mm. And he just kept getting worse and he ended up losing a lot of weight. He could no longer do yoga even. Mm. Um, he was really concerned. We both were that he would end up in a wheelchair or even more compromised than that. And by the way, had he lived and ended up in a wheelchair, we would have figured it out. We would have, transitioned and mm -hmm. and that would have been fine mm -hmm. but again for somebody who was so active yeah. to now having those thoughts and those legitimate fears were really worrisome right and um he as protocol he had been um prescribed different um oh gosh i'm blanking on the word a, like a uh, immunity booster. Mm. Um, I'm completely blank blanking on the word, but that's okay. Um, something that was meant to um, stero steroids is the word. Forgive uh, me. Okay. Was, <laughs> steroids were frequently used as protocol to sort of bridge the gap between kind of the meds not working and just kind of boosting them a little bit so that they would be more effective. And he had taken. Mm steroids before and they were quite effective. So his doctors prescribed steroids this time intravenously um, because Joel was really in such bad shape. So a nurse started coming to the house um, every day for about a week administering these steroids. And I think like the first hour or two, Joel would feel like this rush and burst of energy and he would feel great. But because they, these were exponentially stronger, the dosage, um, he really was meant to just stay inside, um, not be seen in public. Because the irony is that steroids kind of give you this boost, but they compromise your already compromised immune system. Uh, so, they, okay. so being on these steroids at that level kind of make you susceptible. Okay. And so about a month after the steroids were given, Joel started to develop these flu-like symptoms. Mm. Really high fever, um, disorientation. Uh, he couldn't get out of bed. And we were thinking, is this the new MS meds that he's on? Uh. But we weren't panicked. We weren't like, well, this is so strange. Maybe this is the flu. But after three days of extremely high fever and, and what I was just, just you know talking about, we took him to the hospital. He walked himself in. We had a mm. discussion prior to going to, I, I drove us there. It's not like it was. Like, he didn't you know, call 911. It wasn't. Yeah. yeah. So, 
I took him to the hospital. They had no idea what was going on. We went to the emergency room. Eventually they admitted him. And I was thinking, God, maybe this is the flu. And I was desperate to get home and like disinfect everything because I didn't want yeah. so clear eye to get it. Right. And these so, aren't normal MS symptoms, right? This is seemed kind of different. Um, they definitely seem different. It didn't seem like that. That was part of the confusion was like, is this because of the medication or <laughs> is this the flu or like what? It, it definitely yeah. was odd. And, and Joel, listen, he had MS, but he wasn't a sick person. Per mm -hmm. se. So these mm -hmm. were all new things he was experiencing. Um, so he was admitted to a hospital room. I went home, washed everything in a panic. I mean, it seems so silly now. And um, when I went back to the hospital the next day, thinking he might be coming home that afternoon. I, I, sure. you know, I don't know what goes on in a hospital. I thought, okay, they'll, he's sick. He's not feeling well. They'll give him some fluids and he'll come home. Sure. Um, but when I went there the next day, it was stunning because Joel had taken such a turn for the worse and I was so not prepared for it and he was completely out of it could barely talk hmm. it's like he knew that I was there but he couldn't really acknowledge me hmm. and it was devastating and it was at that point that they brought in the infectious disease doctors and a slew of other doctors and they kept asking me if Joel had been bitten, if there was a mosquito bite, if there was um, a spider bite, if there was anything strange. And I was like, no, he's been on lockdown. Like he, he had been home, you know, and the infectious disease doctor was really persistent. And they started t taking tests and taking blood and doing all these kinds of things and kept circling the idea from day one that this was a virus, mm. but they just didn't know which one. Mm. So... Ultimately, after a few days in this hospital, um, I decided to move Joel to his MS doctors because there was to the hospital where his MS doctors were because there was concern that this could be a reaction to the new meds. That was that was the confusion. Again, it was like, what is this? Is it a yeah. virus? Is it the new meds? And MS meds do have some very severe side effects. So the doctors, as smart as they were, and I really trusted each and every one of them, were mystified by what was making Joel so sick so fast. Wow. So I moved him to the hospital closer to him at his MS doctors. And that's when I learned because I asked them, is my husband in a coma? Uh. And the admitting doctor said, well, yeah, like, duh. Like kind casually, of. like, yeah, of course. Like, oh my God. And they're like, she said, you know, well, listen, he's, he's not responsive. He's not communicative. Yeah. It's, he, we'd say he's in a coma. Huh. Was that a shock? That sounds like it would, would be fairly shocking. Uh, when I tell you, Jenny, every step of the way was shocking. And, <laughs> yeah. and then just to get, like, to complete the story. So um, he was then in the hospital for a total of three weeks. He was tested for virus after virus after virus. A lot of the results came back negative from the first hospital. But then as they let the cultures grow, and it took the three weeks, um, eventually it came back um, the culture for West Nile virus came back as positive. Ah, West and Nile. And so then, the, the mosquito bites they were asking about. Yeah. And so, you know, one of Joel's favorite things was to just spend time in our backyard. And when he was getting the steroid infusions, he would sometimes just stand, go outside. He'd be in his bathrobe. He'd walk around the backyard. Yeah, which it. makes sense. It never occurred to us that that would be a danger zone. Sure. You know, we I were mean, keeping him inside and um, we, were, we, we listened to the doctor's orders. Like, you know, while he's on these infusions, stay home, don't go out, don't see other people. But, so we did all that, but who knew right. Right. that being in the backyard would prove lethal? Well, it's kind of like right now. I mean, as we're talking, we're in a pandemic with a different virus, but I mean, like being in your own backyard is kind of part of your own safe space, right? Because it's not other people aren't coughing on your backyard or whatever, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. Exactly. And so, yeah, and, and the virus, you know, much like COVID, what I've learned about viruses is they really, they, you know, there's no cure. Um, there's no treatment. I kept thinking the entire time, I mean, the doctors kept telling me he wasn't getting better. Um, they were keeping me informed of what was no longer functioning. And, um, but still the entire time, a part of me kept thinking, well, once they know what it is, they'll fix him. 
Yeah, sure. Right. Now, once they figure it out, they'll make him better. And then I realized that's not the case. So viruses need to run their course and them running their course um, wreaks havoc on a human being. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you for, for taking us through that. Um, so, and just as a reminder now at the, at this time, you're 46 and Sophie's 13. 13. Okay. And, and by the way, how old is she now? 20. 20. Okay. Okay. Um, so what were those first months like as a, as a newly widowed person, a newly widowed parent? Um, the first months were devastating Mm. and, um, really so hard to believe and really surreal Mm. and nothing made sense. And, I feel like because of my daughter, um, she became my focus in every Mm -hmm. way and for better or worse, you know, I I feel like because of her, I was able to get up every day, get out of bed, get dressed. Um, And even though, you know, I encouraged her to feel her feelings. I I wasn't like, come on, we got to get you to school. It was like, you know, I gave her all the room she needed to, to feel what she was feeling, which was, I mean, I don't want to speak for her, but you know, she was just in as much shock as I, it was so unexpected. Yeah. And so um, strange to, to lose my husband, her father to a mosquito bite. Like I couldn't wrap my head around it. Yeah. Um, And I, I was very um, almost selfish in my, grief because there weren't, I had no peers. I had nobody who knew firsthand what it felt like. Mm. And um, people were trying to help and they were offering suggestions and telling me to join, you know, widow groups and bringing me books. And I just kind of rejected all of it because I felt like, nobody is going to get this. They weren't married to Joel. Uh, like Joel was an amazing person, the best husband I knew. And I, I, I'm not going to relate to these other people. And I don't care if they're my age and lost a husband, like, you know, their experience is different. Right. Almost like, I almost was like elitist about it. Like, <laughs> my grief is bigger and better than anybody's. And, um, it took me a while. I mean, you know, one of my closest friends, Jillian, in the book at one point said to me, uh, you know, we were on the phone and I said to her, I was crying today. I had to pull over when I was driving. I was crying so hard. And she said, me too. And she was being funny. And she said something like, you know, everybody in my neighborhood has seen me cry in the car at the stoplight, at the grocery store. At the... And I said, what are you crying about? Mm. And she's like, you're not the only one who lost him, you know? Mm. And that was like revelatory because it kind of put it in perspective. Like, yeah, I'm not the only one who lost him. Like Joel had a full life. He had a lot of friends, family, people loved him. And I felt like I needed to just open up the slightest bit Mm. and, and in some ways allow other people's grief in if that makes sense to kind of have a more of a collective healing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. about the loss. Yeah. And then at some point early on, I think maybe when you were still in the phase of like, no, nobody, you know, I can't really, nobody can relate or I can't relate to anybody else. You got a, a phone call from a friend of a friend or something. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, so in, in other people's, you know, efforts to help me, um, they, I, I had a lot of friends who had this other friend in common. Um, Her name's Allison. And they would say to me, you really should talk to Allison or you might be getting a call from Allison. Even my rabbi who I became close with that year, because like I said, it was Sophie's bat mitzvah. And then she was very much present when Joel was in the hospital and dying. And even my rabbi said, "Um, you really should talk to Allison. And I kept thinking, I don't, 
want to talk to Allison. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> leave me alone. And then sure enough, one day I got a message from her and I didn't even listen to it. I mean, it took oh, me yeah. a while to listen to it. But after, it was either, a few, it could have been a few months, but eventually I did listen to her message. And I was so impressed that she could actually call. And her message was basically, my name is Allison. I also lost my husband. Um, I'm here if you ever want to talk or grab coffee. And I was like, Mm -hmm. that's nice. Like, good for you. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was finally ready to meet with her because whatever I was doing just wasn't really working for me. Like I really was grieving and, and grieving in a way that was very private and, um, on my own Mm. and I felt like okay maybe I could talk to her and when I did it was amazing we we met for coffee I cried the entire time (laughs) and she (laughs) like her husband had died a few weeks I mean a few years earlier and she really was like I, I felt like my friends were right everybody who encouraged me to talk to her they were completely right it helped me so much just to see another widow Mm. who seemed to have her act together, you know, like Mm. she was, you know, she was a widow. She was sad. She missed her husband, but her life had moved forward Mm. and it was enviable in a way. Mm -hmm. And I was, she had kids around the same age. Yeah. So she had um, twin girls who were a year or two older than Sophie and, um, and we're still great friends and we see each other all the time. And, and she really had a big impact on me. Still does. Yeah, that's terrific. And then I think, did you guys end up ultimately pulling in some additional widowed people and starting a bit of a group? We did. Well, what happened was at our first coffee date, she said something like, you know, I reached out to you because when my husband died, somebody reached out to me. Mm. And so maybe if and when you hear of somebody, you know, a young widow whose husband dies, maybe you'll do the same. Mm. I was like, I'm not doing like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like I don't I, I don't know if that's like you know in my skill set and uh, she's like okay well you'll see him and then we sort of joked that maybe we would start a group uh, um, because she knew a couple of other young widows again she it had been a few years for her and she was more out in the world than I was at the time mm. um, but what happened is a, a year later after we met um I started writing about being a widow. I was in a writing group and um, I was working on a novel and, you know, my background in television and film, you know, I never wrote anything personally. It never occurred to me. Mm. Um, But my friend in the group one day commented like, you know, your husband just died. And I think it would be so crucial to your healing to start writing about your journey and your grief. Mm. And I really bristled at the idea. Yeah. Big surprise. I, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I don't write about myself. I don't write personally. Like I, why would I do that? You but wrote stories just, for 90210 and Bill Nye. You wrote yeah, like stories I did, for other people. Yeah. And like I said, I was working on a novel, like with make-believe characters, make-believe yeah. situations and yeah, it just I didn't write personally. But once I did, I realized how healing and cathartic it was. And I started publishing my essays. So mm. once my essay started getting published, I did start hearing from other young widows. Mm. And a lot of them were here in Los Angeles. So I went back to Allison, again, this is maybe a year later. And I said, Okay, maybe we should do something about all mm. of these young widows, I keep hearing from them, they want to meet. Um, but the caveat for our, our group at the time was that, you know, we're not a bereavement group. It mm. wasn't like we were therapists and we were going to have, um, you know, like conversations that uh, would require a therapist. This was more like a social gathering amongst people who, who understood what mm. it meant to lose your person. Right. Um, and so, so Allison was all in. She was like, yes, let's do it. We can have it at my house. Like, and I was like, okay, I guess I'll send an email. <laughs> I had collected all of these. And again, Allison knew some people and I was hearing from some people, which is by the way, so sad that there would be so many of us yeah. 
but basically. there are right there mm -hmm. are and that yeah. that also speaks to the whole widow wish idea that there are so many like a widow isn't necessarily somebody in their 80s or 90s and right. you know lost their husband or wife of however many years this was like there were a lot of young widows um and a lot of them lived in our neighborhood mm. um which is to, just to sorry interrupt for one second like i know i didn't really realize that until i got in this position and started i don't know paying attention or something like yeah that's yeah, what's, like I think, everybody's yeah. kind of like hiding hiding in plain sight or something yeah i think it is some of that like you know i i just we i didn't know but um anyway the minute i sent out the first email that kind of explains like we're not a bereavement group we're not therapists but we want to hear your story and please come and um and i was so nervous and there were so many names on the email and i barely hit send and the responses were coming in like wow. fast and eager like people were craving that kind of connection wow that's awesome um it really was and and again like when i started writing about my grief and writing about joel and just our life and our time together it was really cathartic and healing for me i had no idea that it would resonate for anybody yeah and so that was really such a gift um and i think that is the spirit in which we decided to have this kind of group was that it was healing to be with others who had experienced something similar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was just it, it was very meaningful and, and impactful for all of us yeah well i hope that people listening might consider taking inspiration from from that and reaching out to some other widowed people you know friends or friends of friends or whatever and trying to get a small social group together for uh, for that type of informal, just sharing and hanging out and stuff. Yeah, I mean, and listen, some, some of us have really um, stayed in touch and talk all the time and go to dinner together. And it's just like a, a touchstone of sorts of like, we have this thing in common that not a lot of people understand. I mean, one of the common themes from the people in the group and certainly from, from like the letters and emails I would receive from people was that nobody understands my story. Mm. Um, my parents, you know, only have their friends who have lost my, you know, my parents in their seventies and their eighties, mm. mm -hmm. they, they want to, you know, have me talk to their friends who are in their seventies and eighties and not, and nothing. I mean, listen, the grief experience is the grief experience. We actually had a few um, older people in our, in a few of our meetings, um, their experience is just as valuable it's just when it happens to you in midlife, um, when you're really not prepared or expecting it at all, mm. it, it is, it feels different. It's not the order of things. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. And in your case, in many people's cases, you know, still parenting, still having young children, like it's a different experience on it. As you say, no more or less valid or difficult or whatever. It's just a different experience of the situation. Yes. Yeah. Um, I do want to back up on the writing group part because um, before you even got to writing about yourself, like just, I think the writing group was maybe one of the very first steps you decided to take. Like, I need to do something for myself here. Can you talk a little bit about how you even got involved in that? Sure. So um, I, my friend Lee is a writer um, and she is one of these people who takes classes all the time and is always doing, um, you know, these seminars and right. And she was encouraging me to join her writing group. Um, and a new session was starting, you know, in a couple of weeks and it happened to be right down the street from my house and it really could not have been any easier. Um, but my first response was no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't do that. I, you know, that's one night a week. I'm not going to leave Sophie. Mm. Um, and she would gently say, you know, Sophie's 13. <laughs> and she could be home alone for two hours and you'll be right down the street. And, mm. or Sophie can go to my house because, because my daughter was friends with her kids, mm. and, you know, but I kind of was using Sophie as my excuse to get out of a lot of things. Um, mm. And I didn't feel right about that either, but it, it also was real. Like I, mm. You know, I 
didn't want to do anything without making Sophie aware of it first. And I really wasn't taking care of myself. Um, and by that, I mean, I, I really made my daughter the priority with every decision. Um, and, but when Lee suggested this writing group, like a little like glimmer went off and I was like, Oh, I, I mean, I haven't written anything in a while and maybe I should. And it, it is just down the street and it is only one night. So I was trying, kind of convincing myself to do it. And once I did make the decision, you know, and I, and I remember telling Sophie, like, I'm thinking of doing this writing group and it's once a week. And she's like, that's fine. And I was like, you know, it's only going to be a couple hours. And she's like, that's fine, mom. But you know, it'll, it's right down the street. She's like, mom, go, like, go do it. Like she probably <laughs> wanted the break from me. When she went uh -huh. um, so I did it. And it really was, again, it was like one of those things like meeting with Allison and now doing something for myself. It was like these little steps I was taking towards healing that I wasn't even aware I was healing yet, but mm. they were crucial to my healing because once I, I joined the writing group and it was also like, I wasn't, there, there were people I didn't know with the exception of my friend Lee. Um, and so they didn't really see me as something other than the woman who now is in our writing group. I wasn't uh, the widow, you know? Right. I mean, I, I introduced myself that way, but once I was there, it was like, I, I was just me, I was Melissa and I was mm -hmm. writing and it was really refreshing to suddenly have this different lens um, of, because I think it, I felt very self-conscious being like the town widow, uh. even though I came to find out, like we were discussing, there are several widows, you know, Allison and I live in the same neighborhood, but I didn't like that idea that when people looked at me, that's what they thought. Mm -hmm. like, uh, a poor woman, her husband just died. Yeah. And so joining this writing group, there wasn't that. There was none of that um, idea of who I was before because they didn't know me before. They knew me now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think listeners will probably relate to that feeling of, of you know, walking around and knowing that everybody knows and looks at you maybe differently or maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So speaking of the writing group then, so you started in the group, you mentioned that you were writing stuff, fiction, just things that, and yeah. then your friend pushed you into writing about your own lived experience right. and you started doing that um, and have had a number of terrific articles, like one in the New York times. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And then another one I'll put in the show notes too. You wrote one for the, um, I think it was maybe the Los Angeles Times. It's called My Boyfriend is Not My Best Friend. Finding Love. Oh, that I wrote more recently. That's on medium.com. On oh, medium. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess this is completely changing topics. And so now, okay, boyfriend. <laughs> you, have, you have an article about your boyfriend. So tell us um, yeah. a little bit about this. So Marcos... Um, and I have been together, my husband's been gone seven years and Marcos and I have been together uh, coming up on about six years. Mm. Um, he was our daughter's guitar teacher and I don't know where to start with him, but I can say that when I met him, when my husband was alive and well and taking Sophie to guitar lessons was Joel's under his jurisdiction because he was the music guy. Mm. And um, he and Marcos knew each other. Um, I wouldn't say they were friends. They were friendly. He, you know, he was our daughter's sure. teacher and Joel really liked him and thought he was really cool. And I had only met Marcos a, at the most, like a handful of times. But every time I met him, I thought, Oh my God, the guitar teacher, so hot. Like, you know, he <laughs> warned me. Uh -huh. um, and after Joel died, a, a few months had gone by and um, a friend invited me to a show that another friend's son was in. Marcos is sort of like the guitar teacher of the neighborhood. Like if your kids ever took guitar or music lessons, they took them with Marcos. So okay. 
he would hold these, these shows that parents and families would come to where he'd be performing, his students would be performing. And my friends really just were looking out for, they, they saw that I was really isolating and not, you know, Joel and I were very social and we knew a lot of people. We had so many friends and my friend, this one friend said, come with me. There's the show. So-and-so's kid is in it. We'll stay for 20 minutes, but I think it'd be good to go. And I was like, hmm. you know, I forced myself. Sophie was busy that night. So I gave myself permission to go see Marcos. And um, I saw Marcos at this gig and he of course knew about Joel and he came over to me and just said, you know, I'm so sorry. Your husband was such a good guy. And like everybody at the time, he said, you know, if you need anything, mm. just let me know. Mm. And so many people, I don't know if you've experienced this too, but you know, there were so many offers of so many things. And I just right. said no to a lot of it, you know. I mean, it's terrific, but sometimes it's difficult to sort through, right? What do I need? I mean, I needed so much. I felt like I needed Joel. Right. And nobody could do that. So yeah. then it's like, how do you sort through all these? Other, like, what, what can they help you with? Yeah. Yeah. But it was funny with timing with that. I had start again, a few months had gone by. Um, I'm trying to think of the timing of this. Joel died in November. This may have been like April. Um. And Marco said, if you need anything, and I had started cleaning out some of Joel's things, mm. um, cleaning out the garage, getting rid of some of his clothes. Um, it was really difficult. You know, at first, all the things I found comfort in, which was like, Joel's toothbrush is still here, and his sandals are still by the door, and his clothes are hanging in the closet next to mine. Like, it was, became really difficult for me to see those things every day. Mm. And I slowly started to get rid of stuff. And somehow I started um, also wanting to clean out the garage. And in the garage, I found a ton of music equipment, stuff I didn't even know we had, you know, amplifiers and guitars and speakers and microphones and tambourines. And I was like, I, like, I couldn't believe it. I had no yeah. memory of any of these things. And so when I ran out to Marcos that night, he's like, if you, if you need help with anything. And I was like, actually, I don't know what to do with any of that stuff. If you yeah. want to help me with that, that would be great. So he did. He, he actually, he showed up and I still thought he was attractive, which I couldn't believe I was like still having that feeling. You know, <laughs> my husband had just died and like, here was a guitar teacher. <laughs> um, but um, he also was very cool and almost similar to, the other writers in my writing group, he, he wasn't thrown by the fact that I was a widow. He would mm. talk about Joel very comfortably and very easily. I liked that he knew that they knew each other and that he would bring up Joel's name and there it wasn't like in a quiet, mm. you know, it was like very just matter of fact. He, he that, knew my husband and not something to tiptoe around or like be yeah. awkward about or something. Yeah. And I, I found that so comforting in a way because I think people do find it very awkward um, to have a conversation with the widow, you know, mm. um, and Marcos didn't. Um, and so he came to help me with some stuff and that went on for like a few, like a, a month or so, maybe two months. There was so much stuff and like some stuff he sold for me, some stuff he gave to his students. He took some stuff. Um, but then that just sort of led to us spending time together um and i didn't think about it i didn't think about oh he's so cute or is this weird i'm having lunch with marcos or mm. i think marcos may have asked me for a date i didn't know if it was really a date you know, like it was but i didn't um i gave myself the luxury of just not overthinking it and i just thought i'm just gonna go with this feeling and it was very easy but um yeah I mean those those early days were were still very confusing I was still very much grieving I would cry a lot when Marcos and I were together um and he just was very like he just has a way about him where he's very comfortable in his own skin and again he was very matter of fact and would easily talk about Joel and was there to comfort me if I was having a moment 
Um, but I didn't think we were really like dating. I didn't think we were, I didn't really think about him or his place in my life. And, and, you know, it was so soon after Joel had died and I just had all those feelings in my head, like, this is wrong. I shouldn't be having these thoughts. I shouldn't be having these feelings, but I did. And, um, eventually we kind of just, it just kind of happened and I let it happen. But I think that if I did give it any kind of thought at all in a serious way, nothing would have happened. Mm. <laughs> if that makes sense. I mean, we just, I just kind of went with it. I think it was a time where I was so like overthinking everything. I felt the weight of responsibility being the only parent. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there was, because there was so much on my plate, both just emotionally and physically and, and just in terms of stuff I had to do just to keep Sophie and I moving forward, mm -hmm. that Marcos really was like this reprieve from yeah. everything I had to do all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah. So um, was it tricky at all? I mean, you mentioned that like he was everybody's kid's guitar teacher. He was, you know, visible in your community and you're there and everybody knew that you were the widow. Like, how was that? I mean, what did people react? Well, did you have awkwardness? Like, how did that? It was go? really awkward. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It was awkward. Um, I mean, I think what what people kind of hooked onto was the fact like, oh yeah, the whole music thing. Like, yeah, that, uh, that would make sense. You know, like they knew that, you know, Joel was obviously in the music industry. That's how Joel and I met. I was, you know, worked at a record label when I was really young. Um, they knew I was into music and then here's like the music guy. So it was like, oh, but that was the only thing about us that, <laughs> that made sense. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and it was awkward and uncomfortable. And people would say things to me um, in the passage I read at the top of the show, you know, that was um, kind of this revelation that I was widowish when I was at a party with Marcos. And it was the first time he and I had done anything publicly. Mm. Um, I had told a few friends here and there about him. And for the most part, people were very happy for me. But we went to this party together and a woman in the neighborhood who I liked um, and we knew each other for years, saw me walk in with Marcos and she pulled me aside. I mean, we had literally just walked through the door and she pulled me aside and she said, you're here on a date? Hmm. When did your husband die again? Ugh. And it really sent me into a tailspin. But probably with that judgment tone, kind of. Yeah, kind of like she couldn't figure it out. Yeah. Like, and, and I do think this is part of the story. Um, but yeah, you know, she had been divorced for a number of years. And I don't know how successful her dating life had been. Mm. And so I think it was coming from that, this like curiosity, like, Mm. your husband died and you're here on a date. Like I, I felt like in a way, like the rest of that would have been, I've been dating and I can't find anybody to bring to a party, you know, like, uh, I see. So as opposed to like, what are you doing? Your husband just barely. Dead. I think it's a mix of, I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt, but I think it was a mix of both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. then, the, yeah, there was, I mean, you know, listen, we didn't make declarations about our relationship or even to each other for, for a while, but I just liked being in his company. I liked, um, again, that he was very comfortable around me. And I felt like there were so many people who weren't and even close friends who it just, they, I knew they felt awkward being around me because we were couples friends and our kids were friends and they didn't quite know how to place me mm. in a way. Um, and I liked that there was none of that with Marcos. Mm -hmm. He just kind of was there. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Well, and that, and so in this, in the medium piece, which you wrote more recently, you said, um, you talked a little bit about how like relationships and love can be different, you know, in your twenties when you're young, the first time around versus, you know, in midlife. Can you talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like, um, you know, when you're in your 20s, you kind of have this checklist of like, this the guy, like, are we going to make money together? Are we going to be able to buy a house? Do I want to have kids with him? What is our future going to look like? How, you know, and I felt like, you know, with Marcos, again, I wasn't thinking we were going to be in a relationship, but the piece you're referring to, I say, my boyfriend is not my best friend. Um, and I started out by saying Joel really was. Joel mm. was absolutely my best friend. And we got each other and understood each other and shared every detail of every moment with each other. Mm -hmm. um, that is not Marcos. And I've come to learn that, you know, love is very different in middle age. I mean, for me, it is. Um, I am, you know, confident in who I am and what I have. I, you know, I, I don't need to buy a house with Marcos. Mm -hmm. I have my kid. I'm not mm -hmm. looking at more kids. Uh -huh. um, he has a son also. Um, you know, like I'm not, we're, it's a different kind of partnership. And I think we're both really okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also feel like, um, you know, I, again, I wasn't, and didn't want to overthink our relationship and I just kind of let it happen, but we're very different kinds of people and we really don't make a lot of sense, Marcos and I, but it works. Um, and having him in my life is, um, is so important, uh, but it's also so important to me that I have the friends that I do. And my fr I've always had a lot of friends and always been social, and um, my friends have always meant everything to me. But in losing my husband, those friendships have really gotten stronger, and I feel like I have, like, the best of everything with Marcos. I have this like loving relationship. And then I can go to my friends with things I wouldn't necessarily go to Marcos with. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. You know, yeah. I think at one point I was like, no, I should be able to tell him everything. And I do, but like, does he really know that I, you know, went to Costco and spent a half hour looking at vacuum cleaners? No, <laughs> he doesn't need to know that. But my best friends would be riveted. You know, if I called <laughs> Julian and I said, I was just at Costco, wait till you hear about the vacuum cleaner. She's like, Oh, tell me, uh, you know, <laughs> So that's the difference, I guess. Yeah. Is for, for again, for me, that's yeah. how I feel that love is just different. I and it and our relationship works. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for talking about that because I think it is um, helpful for people to see that there's different ways, you know, to if if you're thinking about a relationship after your spouse dies there's many different ways that could look many different ways that could fit into your life, including not having, you know, not repartnering, right. including, including remarrying and, you know, merging lives or including something else. Like, um, I think there's a, what do they call it? Living apart together is a, is a, yeah. a is happening more and more these days. That's me and Marcos. We live yeah. on the same street on different corners mm. and it's, <laughs> it's pretty ideal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's great to hear, you know, um, to see different examples of things because it's it doesn't all have to be, you know, all or nothing one way or another. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm rambling, but <laughs> no, you're making sense. And and you know, I will also say, like, I don't feel like, um, you know, I still feel married to Joel. I still feel like he is my husband. Mm -hmm. The fact that Marcos accepts that and understands that is like everything to me. Like, right. he gets it. And right. that is so meaningful. And that he doesn't have to be a competition or a replacement or a, anything like that. It can, it can be a, an and. You have your relationship with Joel and you have your current relationship and it can all work. And it, it, and it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Well, I'm really happy for you. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and thanks for talking about that. Um, okay, well... So guys, this is this has just been terrific. We've covered so many um, really, I think, important topics, and I really appreciate you reflecting on all this. I think it's really, you know, so many widowed parents that I talk to, or widowed people in our age group, just feel alone. Um, like you know, you were saying that you initially did, and then discovered 
you know, all these people around you. Um, so thank you for sharing that because I think hearing other people's stories and hearing, you know, their journey and then how things have gone since their loss is, is really important to, um, to help people feel less alone. So I could feel like I could keep asking you questions all day here, but I do think we probably <laughs> should wrap it up. So um, I'll just ask one last question then. Uh, I'd like to ask all my listeners, if you could say one thing to newly widowed parents, what would you say to them? Um, I could give you a really long answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> whatever you I, like. I feel like, um, you know, becoming widowed in midlife is so unsettling and so traumatic. And I think it's so important that people relieve themselves of any expectations of how they should be grieving. Um, I think you, know, you probably hear this a lot, but there's no right way to grieve. Um, just as there is no wrong way. Um, you know, for example, my daughter slept in my bed. She was 13 and she started sleeping with me when Joel was in the hospital. Mm. Um, and she stayed sleeping with me in, in my room um, pretty much the entire first year. Mm -hmm. um, and it never occurred to me that that was weird or wrong or shouldn't be happening. I think... Um, she needed the comfort, you know, she was an only child. There were no other kids for her to share in that. Just as I was kind of looking for my peer group as a 13 year old girl, she couldn't find people who related to her either. Mm -hmm. um, which is also why I think um, when I did finally meet Allison and, and my daughter got together with her daughters, it was great. But I guess my point is that there's just no right or wrong way. And I hear people are always like, thinking they're doing it wrong. And that's an impossibility. You can't do it. You're going to feel the way you feel. And again, it's a traumatic thing. And I always just encourage people to feel what they're feeling because that's the only way through it. And, yeah. and one of the things I talk about in, in the book is, um, you know, feeling lost in a place that is completely familiar. Um, and it's almost like learning this new language of grief. Like I, I couldn't, fathom that I was living in the same house, driving the same car. Um, my daughter was going to the same school, but Joel wasn't here anymore. Mm, like it yeah. seemed like I was in this alternate universe, this alternate reality. And it was so unsettling and discombobulating. Um, but eventually it becomes, the world becomes familiar again. And I just think time is really a miraculous healer. And that's what I would say to other people and your listeners is you got to give yourself the time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I think, I think that's actually a great place to end. So uh, my guest today is Melissa Gould, author of the new memoir, Widowish, out uh, February 2nd. So Melissa, where can listeners find you and where can they find your book? Um, they can find me at widowish.com. And my book is available on Amazon. Okay, well, I'll make sure to, um, I'm sorry, what? No, I was going to say, if anybody but also who reads the book would like to leave a review, that would also be great. I would appreciate that. Absolutely. And as we know, Amazon reviews are super important for authors. So. Yes. Um, terrific. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you so much, Jenny. This was fantastic. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Melissa Gould as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 94. And a big shout out today to all my listeners in California in honor of today's guest who is in Los Angeles. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you know of any resources that you think I should know about in your area, uh, be sure to reach out and let me know. I've got a few resources for you guys this week. Um, first of all, very excited to see that two of my guests are having a webinar together. It's a free webinar series that Allison Gilbert is hosting. It's called the Past and Present Webinar Series. And she's kicking that off with her very first guest, Dr. B.J. Miller. 
And longtime listeners will recall that I've spoken with both of them in the past. I'd encourage you to check out both of their books. They're terrific. And both of those discussions, uh, both of those guests had so many interesting things that um, I learned a lot from, and I hope you will as well. And if you'd like to hear them uh, speaking on February 25th, do check out Allison's webinar. The best way to find the link to sign up is to go to Allison's Instagram page, which is at a Gilbert writer on Instagram. Uh, another resource for you this week, there's a service called Grief Coach, which is uh, grief support via text messaging. And I've actually set up an affiliate link with them. So if you go to their website, which is grief.coach, uh, you can use the code Jenny Lisk, all one word, J-E-N-N-Y-L-I-S-K. And there's a discount for you on the subscription. And I also get a small affiliate fee um, if you're interested in signing up for that as well. So I think it's a really unique and interesting service that could be of help to a lot of you guys. So I wanted to make sure to share that with you. And finally, uh, the Ask Lisa podcast. I know I've talked about Dr. Lisa Demore on the show before. I interviewed her when her uh, book came out um, a while ago now. And her second book uh, is called Under Pressure, and it's about stress and anxiety in teenage girls. Uh, I think a good place to start, actually, is with her first book, if you have a daughter who's in high school or middle school or even approaching middle school. It's called Untangled, Guiding Teenage Girls Through the Seven Transitions into Adulthood. And for all parents, Lisa Demore has a new podcast called the Ask Lisa Podcast. So check that out on iTunes and Google Podcasts and everywhere where you like to listen to podcasts. It's not grief specific. It's about parenting in general, whether you have sons, daughters, all ages, teenagers, young kids, in between age kids. Uh, do check that out because that is a terrific resources and they're covering a lot of really timely topics these days. Okay, so that's about all for this week. I do want to remind you where you can find the links to buy Future Widow. If you go to futurewidowbook.com, you can find the links to find the paperback or the ebook at all the retailers. And actually, if you want to buy the ebook directly from me, I've set up a special discount for my listeners, 15% off. And the code is listener15. So if you go to my store on Payhip, it's payhip.com slash Jenny. You can find that and look for the spot where you enter the coupon code and it's listener15, all one word. I hope that you check it out and uh, I hope you find it helpful. Okay, thank you as always for listening and until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.